Hello, and thank you for joining us for this week's sermon. This the last week of September. While I certainly miss meeting in person and long for the day when we can return back to meeting in this place safely, I'm grateful that we can still gather together as a church family and worship virtually. If you haven't done so already, after the sermon, I invite you to watch this week's Worship Elements video, which can be found on our Facebook and YouTube pages. There you will find hymns and music, scripture readings and prayer, meditations, and our children's sermon, all of which are meant to fit together with today's message. I bring you greetings from our pastor, Aaron Conaway, who's away this weekend on a retreat. But fear not, he'll be back tomorrow and will be preaching with us again next Sunday. Our sermon for today comes from this week's gospel reading, which is from Matthew chapter 21, starting in verse 23. And it begins this way. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Brian Blout, president and professor of New Testament at Union Presbyterian Seminary, likens this passage to a version of the old joke how many people does it take to change a light bulb? You know the joke and have probably heard it told in several different variations. One of them goes this way. How many Baptists does it take to change a light bulb? None. Baptists don't believe in change. I know. It's not really that funny. Yet there may be a kernel of truth found in this joke, something that I know is difficult for many of us to discuss, maybe even some of you. Sometimes things have to change but we would rather it not. We can become enamored with the way things have been. We hold on to these ways of old that make us feel comfortable and safe and fear the new ways that are unknown, unproven, but most certainly bad. We like it when things and people know their place and stay there and despair at the thought of someone shaking the system up. This joke can be a bit of a social commentary on how we can be sometimes. And it's just what is happening in our gospel reading for today. Jesus has been moving in and around Galilee and shaking things up. His words and actions stand in sharp contrast to the established religious leadership. He challenges their interpretations of the law, an interpretation that they hold as sacred as God's own words. He preaches a message that flips the world upside down and reorders both people and practices. The first shall be the last, and the last first. Blessed are the poor in spirit and the meek, not the privileged and proud. Blessed are the merciful and peacemakers, not the powerful and well-armed. He heals the unhealable. He touches the untouchable. He fellowships with the outcast. He eats with the sinner. He speaks for those who haven't been allowed to speak for themselves, and he even breaks a few of the modern laws and calls them unjust. Now Jesus has come to Jerusalem, the center of religious and political life. He rides into town like a king, greeted by gathered crowds who have spread their garments on the pathway as they would for any hero's welcome. They sing, they celebrate, they wave palm branches and cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, O son of David. Then Jesus turns and goes to the temple, where he becomes angry and causes quite a scene. You remember, he flips over the tables and drives out the money changers. He disrupts the structure and order of things and chastises the religious leadership for desecrating the temple with their malpractice. Something new is happening. Jesus is changing things. It is as if he just walked in, climbed up on a ladder, and change the light bulb. He does this without asking anyone's permission. He just takes the old light bulb out, which is still burning, by the way, albeit dimly. And he puts in a new, brighter bulb, one that lights up the whole place and shines on the darkest of practices. And some are mad. They don't want a new bulb. The old one seems to be working just fine for them. The chief priests and elders walk over to Jesus and ask, just who do you think you are? I think the chief priests and the elders have raised a perfectly fair and reasonable question for Jesus. He has barged into the temple like he owns the place and is changing things up. 
His behavior is well outside the bounds of social norms and customs in the least. But of course, we know that the point of this question really pushes far past those customs and concerns. They're trying to spring a trap for Jesus, something bigger. This man, this Jesus, has been speaking with authority. He's been teaching with authority, leading with authority, healing with authority, casting out demons with authority, forgiving with authority, and even conferring his authority onto his own disciples. Just where did Jesus get all of this authority? The chief priests and the elders are trying to force him to admit in front of everyone that he doesn't really have any real authority to do any of these things. By their question, what they're really saying is this. Where is his resume? Show us his curriculum vitae. His family heritage is unknown. He has not gone to a prestigious school, or any school for that matter. He has no undergraduate degree, no seminary degree, no doctorate of ministry or theology. He has no diploma or certificate. He has not been licensed or ordained. He carries with him no letter of reference. No one has mentored him. He has neither fought nor bought into any position of leadership, and no one has voted him into office. He is someone who has gone rogue, a wannabe prophet, a one-man self-righteous writer. We're asking him to show us his credentials because we know he doesn't have any. And you want to know why we know this? Because we are the ones who give out the credentials. We are the elders who teach and train the young. We are the chief priests who pick and direct the associate priests. We are both the nominating committee and the deciders. We are the ones in charge. We are the ones who make things happen. And this Jesus, he has not taken any of our classes. He has not read from any of our books. He's not turned in any of our assignments. He's not taking any of our tests. There's no way he could pass any of our finals. He is trying to circumvent our long established and perfectly good system, and he has absolutely no right to do so. Okay, they didn't really say all of that, but you know they're thinking it. It's just right underneath the surface. Maybe it's an attempt at clever manipulation or for fear of the crowds that have been following Jesus with great excitement. But the chief priests and elders are going to try to get Jesus to be the one to say all of this himself. They're just going to ask him a simple question, and they want him to admit it. They want him to own up to the fact that he doesn't have any authority to change the label. He's a fraud, or even worse, a fool that actually believes that God has given him to do the, the authority to do what he has done. They're just asking a question, just a little, perfectly reasonable, totally unavoidable, simple, short, and honest, maybe, question. And as members of the Jewish aristocracy, it's well within their right to ask. I think now is a, a good time for me to say that I think questioning someone's authority can be a good, even necessary exercise from time to time, even if it's a workout that can wear us out. I know it makes a lot of people nervous, including yours truly, but it's all part of necessary checks and balances that can protect people from those who might overstep or abuse their positions. Because we all know that with authority comes power. And power can be used for good or it can be used for harm. It's an important task, questioning authority. And that's been happening a lot around our country lately. One might say that we are up to our necks with it. These are tense times, anxiety is high. A lot of things, a lot of people, a lot of institutions are being called into question. Policing and politics, judges and courts, rights and privileges, votes and methodology, medical experts and personal freedoms, leaders and followers, citizenship, even basic human rights. But you know, we Americans have a, have a long history of questioning authority. It's, it's almost like it's one of our founding principles, kind of how America began, became to be in the first place. 
It seems like it's in our blood, it's in our bones. It's what we do. And in at least a few ways, it's worked out well for us. And I know that in the midst of all that is happening right now, we're all praying. We're all praying a lot. God be with us and give us the courage to say and do what is right. Courage. Courage brings us back to this reading from Matthew 21, where we find the chief priests and the elders questioning Jesus's authority. One might think they have a lot of courage for challenging Jesus in this way, but they do not. In fact, they have fear more than anything. It's really fear masked with courage. They know all about this Jesus, his message and his mission. They know he's trying to flip the world upside down, that he's come to lift up the valleys and lower the hills, to straighten the crooked pathways and make the rough places smooth. They know he's coming to relieve them of their power because they are the corrupt ones. He is ushering in a kingdom that will be upheld with justice and righteousness. And they are scared because it means that they are losing out what they hold most dear, their authority. You know, one of the things that was a bit of a challenge for me when I started reading the Bible as an adult was relearning who Jesus really is. I was taught as a child that Jesus was nice and kind, quiet and well-mannered, and was really big on rule following. I was taught that I always needed to follow the rules because that's what Jesus did. And if I just followed all the rules, just like Jesus, I could get dessert after dinner, or a basket of candy at Easter, or presents on Christmas morning. The WWJD craze hit when I was in high school. You might, you might remember those bracelets with the initials WWJD, which stood for What Would Jesus Do? I wore one. Several of my friends did as well. Anytime we saw someone doing or saying something untoward, we would snap our bracelets at them and ask, what would Jesus do? These bracelets were a helpful reminder to always be good, and quiet and well-mannered and rule-following kids. But you know what was never said? People didn't go around saying, you know what Jesus would do. Sometimes Jesus would come in and flip the tables and challenge the unjust authorities. But that's just what Jesus did. He did. It's right here in our Bibles. And why did he do it? Because sometimes things have to change, even if some of us would rather them not. Amen. Sisters and brothers, my hope and prayer for you this week is that however dark the night gets, know that you are being held by a love like this. The creator who made you still claims you in his covenant love. The Redeemer who died for your sake lives again by the word of God. And the sustainer of all creation yet breathes courage into your heart. Go then, serve boldly, for God's desire encompasses the whole creation. Go in peace.